Would that be done? Would you like to start? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what's uh, the biggest difference to the original Robocop? I mean, uh, what would you say can the audience look forward to? Biggest difference is that one has Peter Wheeler and the other has Joe Kinnaman. No, I'm kidding. Uh, I, think, uh, I think there are two differences, two big differences. Um, the biggest one is that in the original Robocop, after Alex Murphy shot to pieces, you have a small montage and then you have a robot. Alex Murphy's dad and, and he's a robot. And he only comes back, begins to slowly come back at the end. Uh, in our version of it, uh, when Alex Murphy wakes up as Robocop, his intellect is intact, his memory is there, um, his cognitive functions are there. So you have a man who is being told he's a robot. And, and so we have in our movie the journey between being a man, being told he's a robot, to actually becoming one. And that allows us to talk about the philosophical issue of what it is that sets up a man apart from a machine. Uh, and it is a philosophical issue, and you might not think it is, but if you look at the literature and the, and the actual uh, the full position of philosophy, most philosophers think uh, men are nothing but organic machines and that there's no such thing as free will. And this is the standard analytical philosophy position nowadays. So we thought we could use the concept of Robocop not only to talk about the politics, fascism, when you automate violence, about the drones and all the things that we talk about, but also include uh, this human dimension and this uh, inquiry, this quest of this character about what it means to be human and also his relation with the family. That, I think, is the biggest difference. J'ai lu dans une interview que Joël avait vu le film original près d'une vingtaine de fois. Donc je voulais savoir du coup comment il avait réussi à comment il était parvenu à faire sa propre interprétation interprétation du personnage sans être trop influencé. Um, well, Joel, this question for you. Uh, he read that you, you'd seen the original Robocop at least like 20 times. So basically the question is, how did you manage to make this film and your Robert your own, so to speak? Well, uh, there's two parts to, to that answer. The, the first one is that it's a completely different universe that Jose has created from that that was Peter Weller, um, Paul Verhoeven's. So that makes it a lot easier, and, and the character's journey is completely different, and he lives in a different time. Um, so there are some similar experiences that he goes through, but, and, and then he becomes in this, uh, in this, melded into this suit, uh, or, or this robotic uh, body. Um, but apart from that, his, his journey is completely different. Um, and the second part of that is, just, even though it would have been identical, which, which it's not, it, I mean, I come from the theater, and in the theater we do this all the time. Uh, you don't think about the last person that played Hamlet or Raskolnikov. Uh, you have to create your own universe in, in the universe that this particular play is, is being, being done. So, um, and if you start thinking about what someone else has done, then you've already failed anyway. So, so, um, but for this instance, it was particularly easy. Um, I never, if you put the two movies together, you will feel that they're two completely different films that have a couple of ideas that are the same. But apart from that, they're very much their own movies. Alors, une question pour les acteurs. Dans, dans le film euh, Robocop, euh, on a l'impression qu'il n'a qu pas été construit euh, aux états unis ou au Japon, mais, mais en Chine. Pourquoi la Chine et pourquoi pas la France Oui, <rire> José, your Robocop seems to have been built in China. So, why China Why not France or the US uh, or whatever The short answer to that is that labor in France is way more expensive than in China. And, <laughs> and that's why America has been outsourcing factories to China for a long time already. 
and that was kind of a political joke uh, about outsourcing. You know, it's, it's, it's a little bit about, you know, a funny thing is that when I spoke with Michael Keaton for the first time about the character of Sellers, right, the creator of the idea, let's put a man inside the machine, uh, we always discussed Sellers as not being a bad guy in the sense that superhero movies have bad guys like the Joker. The Joker is going to kill everybody, he's going to blow the city over the top thing. We wanted a grounded movie, a realistic film in which the bad guy ain't necessarily a bad guy at all. I mean, he believes that r machines are good, he believes that robots are good, uh, and he wants that implemented in his society. He also wants a profit, uh, as you know, most, uh, most CEOs do for their uh, multinational companies. And, uh, and, and corporates. Uh, and so we created that character, um, and Michael always talk, talked about Steve Jobs, like a guy who is smart, smart about technology, who gets great products like Apple does. But at the same time, you know, Apple outsourced their products to China, and sometimes the laborers, the people working on those products, work under very hard conditions. And um, we tried to make a social commentary on that, uh, and hence we have Robocop being made in China. <laughs> okay. A question for you both. Do you read comics, and what do you think about the adaptation to the screen? Uh, sorry, what am I going Yes. Um, if we read comics. Do you read comics, comics yes. And what do you think about the adaptation to the screen? Um, I read... Some, it, I rarely read comics actually, I have friends who read them like a slave, um, but um, I mean in Robocop that was actually the opposite, it was the film came first and then they adapted it to, yes. to a comic. Um, I think um, the, the most movies that are made right now, they, they sort of already have a, a pre, pre-concept, uh, there's, there's some, uh, what, what do you call it? Uh, they're based uh, on something, yeah. Uh, on, on, yeah. On a book or, or on, on a comic. And, I mean, it, uh, for me, I always look at it as if it's a good story, it's a good story. And, and if somebody came up with it as an original idea or somebody took a good idea and made it into a screenplay, that's fine. But yeah. I, I look at every, at every script for standing alone. Okay. I've read every single uh, asterisk you can think of. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually Belgium. <laughs> <laughs> Just so we don't forget. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I read I read comic books. I read comic books uh, when I was a child. Not only asterisks but others. Um, I think that the adaptation of asterisks are criminal. I'm <laughs> <laughs> and they are. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. but that doesn't mean that all adaptations are going to be necessarily bad. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, um, film has its own logic, its own uh, dramatic way of constructing stories. Sometimes the comic book lends itself uh, to be translated from the what's peculiar and specific about comic books into the universe of film, sometimes it doesn't. Like, and you can ask the same question backwards. Like, like Joe said, Robocop, ha clearly, in 87, Verhoeven made a great movie. So that concept lended itself to film. Now, when it was translated into film, into comic book, it didn't quite work, at least to me. So it's, it, it cuts both ways. And it's really, I really w like to think about it as a, as, as whether the dramatic characteristic of one media uh, can be translated to the other media and vice versa. And the same question applies to literature. Some books can be and have been successfully uh, adapted to, uh, to cinema, like Dublin Nances from, uh, it's, it's a clear, it's, there are several books that have been adapted. Uh, Catch-22 uh, is, is a great book and a great film, but sometimes you can't. I mean, you just cannot adapt. How are you going to adapt Finnegan's Wake from James <laughs> Joyce? You don't even understand what's in there. You know what I mean? So it's all, it's all about um, it, a translation process from one dramatic uh, structure that's 
pertains to a kind of me to some certain kind of media into the other one, and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, and it depends on the story. I actually think that the best books that get translated into films are the ones that have a, a simple, interesting story with good plot points, but where the literature is kind of is weak, and the, and the uh, the author's voice is uninteresting because then it's it's usually it's easier to take those stories and the plot points, put them into a script, and then you put a different voice um, as as the narration. Because I think often what bothers people that are big fans of a book, they they, they get this strong feeling because the the the, the voice of the author is so strong, and that is so hard to translate. It's almost, it's impossible. Okay, thank you. Une question pour Joël. Je voulais savoir donc comment s'est passé euh, sa rencontre avec euh, Gary Oldman et euh, de tourner avec euh, des acteurs euh, de de cette trempe là, euh, Gary et Michael Keaton. Oui. Well, basically, I mean, uh, it's it's about your you're working with uh, Gary Oldman. You're meeting him first. How did it go? You're working with him or working with such high caliber actors as he and Michael Keaton, for instance. Yeah, I mean, I mean that was uh, it was a dream come true for me and. In this. And, and you know, particularly with Gary Oldman and, and with Michael Keaton as well, and Samuel Jackson, just to be in a film with these guys that I've, you know, revered. I'd watched all their films, and uh, you know, and in some cases, I'd even studied how they work, and um, and to get to play opposite Gary and have this um, this storyline that were, where they were so connected and and how their relationship evolved. Um, it's you know one of the if not the, the best experience that I've had in my career, but also in my life. Um, and, and particularly some of these scenes that were the most difficult scenes in the film, uh, particularly the one where it, it is revealed what's left of me. Because uh, that, that was the scene that I looked forward the most to, to shoot, but also the one that I was... Um, it was the biggest challenge. Because the emotions that needed to be portrayed in a truthful way were those of extreme existential anxiety and despair. And, and usually when you try to portray these kind of feelings, you, you want to use your body. I mean, if, if you all think of the, the moment when you've had the most anxiety or, or just felt that kind of existential despair, you're usually like clenching your stomach or crying in a fetus position and, and as an actor when you're trying to reenact those kind of feelings it's very helpful to use your body and it helps the emotion to come forth um, and here I didn't have that luxury at all I, I, had, I had they actually had to strap my head in with a metal cord um, so it would like pull my head back because as soon as I moved my head which you naturally do when doing these feelings the shot was you couldn't be used. Um, so I had to be completely still and, and it all had to come from my imagination. So it was a much higher difficulty level in, in, that, in that scene. And, um, and the, you know, the, the big help that I had in that scene was that I was playing opposite Gary Oldman, who, you know, his eyes were always so present and engaged. So, um, so it really helped me, push me through. Yeah, um, question for you, Joel. Um, in the press sheet, you were cited saying that you were completely naked in the armor. <laughs> Is that true, and why? <laughs> well, I, I, no, it's not completely true. I had this unitard underneath. It was this like sort of bodysuit. Um, what I was getting to was that I, I would f I'd feel naked, and when I was fantasizing of what, what what the feeling would be to be amputated from your throat down. Um, what I came up with, it must be the most naked feeling that you could ever have, um, to, to not have a body but still be aware. And, and it, it started, made me think of these dreams that I've had when all of a sudden I'm in the middle of a city and there's people all around and people that I know and I have no clothes on and I have no place to hide. And, um, and the suit made me feel a little bit like that when I was walking around on set. Not when we were shooting the camera, but just when I was walking around and sort of telling a story and I couldn't... Uh, and I, I'd feel a little weird and awkward. Um, so when I was trying to come into the sort of the psychology of what Alex would feel like <coughs> as he had become Robocop and moving forward, the suit became uh, an instrument for me to find the emotional contrast that he's, 
at once has this incredibly powerful body, but he's also extremely vulnerable. And I was surprised that the suit helped me find that. Okay. Une question pour tous les deux. Um, si le film fonctionne bien au box office, est-ce que vous seriez partant pour, pour faire une suite Peut-être que, peut que Joël a même aussi déjà un contrat pour plusieurs films, qui sait <laughs> Oh well, if the film is a huge success, box office-wise, etc., will you consider doing a sequel Maybe you already have a contract Stating so, I mean, can no, we have the big secret no, out? You know, you know why he's pointing the gun to me? Because why? I, I right. don't have the contract. He does. Ah, <laughs> ah, smart move. But, but how is he going to make any other films when both of his arms are broken? You know, like, exactly. and he can't play tennis, and you know. So I think it'll be better uh, for the him. The answer to, to your question is, uh, it's. I mean, on my end is. Why do I make a movie? Why do I make movies in general, and why do I make a movie in particular? Like I've, I've, every movie that I've made, I've made for a reason, so I could use cinema to talk about something that's of interest to me. So I, yeah, I've done Robocop, which is a hundred and twenty, thirty million dollar movie. I also done Garapa, which is twenty thousand dollar movie. And I spent five years, spent more time doing Garapa than I did Robocop. Five years doing one, three years doing another. It's not about to me. It's about being able to reach audiences to provoke thought, provoke thinking, sometimes provoke controversy, like Elite Squad, um, on issues that are meaningful to the audience, but also to me, mostly to me, because otherwise I wouldn't be able to do it. Uh, in this Robocop, there is an issue that's meaningful to me, which is, there are more than one, but there is one core issue, which is the core idea of Verhoeven, that the automation of violence opens the door or window to fascism, and we have to be aware of that. We are already using drones, we'll soon be replacing soldiers by machines. Okay. And what happens? You know, what happens when, if America, America pulled out of Vietnam because there were soldiers dying there. If you take away the soldiers and you put robots, what would have happened? Nobody's dying. Okay. That's a serious issue. Uh, every country in the world will have to define its own legislation on how to deal with this technology. Maybe Brazil will use robots for law enforcement, maybe you won't, same thing for France, but it's going to have to have a decision, same thing, the UN will have to debate what is going to be legal or illegal on war. And, and, um, and so Robocop was a concept that allowed me to, to bring these issues for, forward in a movie uh, that would reach a broad audience, because I could also do visual effects with it and, and convince uh, some crazy people to back this, this up, <laughs> which doesn't need a lot of work in the Hollywood because everybody's crazy there are anyway. Uh, and uh, you know, and so I wanted to make that movie. So if you ask me, uh, are you going to do a sequel of Robocop? My question is, what is it about? I mean, if it's not about something that interests me, I'm, I'm not doing it. If it is, I may. So it has nothing to do with the success of the movie. I mean, the success of the movie has to do with the funding Wait. for the next movie. Yeah. Not with my wish to do it. <laughs> what about you? You thought you would escape the question, no? <laughs> no, I sorry. Mean, for me, I, I mean, I've done a lot of very interesting characters so far in 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 both theater and film that have had you know very you know interesting character arcs. They've gone through a lot of things, and and Robocop might be the one that has the most interesting character arc and. You know, of course, I would like to uh, continue Alex Murphy's journey of, of dealing with who he is and and and, and what he could be. Um, but you know, it's always it's up to the audience. Oui. J'ai une question, but plus pour les deux. Donc, euh, dans le film original, le, donc euh, l'agent Lewis est une femme. Là, c'est un c'est un homme. Du coup, est-ce qu'on aurait pu euh, imaginer un Robocop euh, féminin? Et un père au foyer au lieu de. <laughs> well, obviously, in the, in the original, I mean, Agent Lewis is a woman. I mean, do you think that there could be the possibility of uh, why not imagining the Robocop being a woman and the man being a, house, a housewife, so to speak? I mean, more into house things. Uh, why not? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, why not? I mean, that's already, maybe I want to do the next role, <laughs> but it doesn't have you in it. <laughs> maybe we can find some robot. Uh, yeah. <laughs>
Well, it's <laughs> total blue. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to make another piece for that. <laughs> yeah, it's it could be. Why not? I think it's interesting. It's a good idea. Yeah. Hmm. Alors, on a adoré, enfin, je pense que mes camarades ont aussi aimé le film. Et j'ai un problème depuis que, que j'ai vu le film, c'est que j'ai l'impression que lorsque je marche, je marche comme Robocop. Est-ce que vous avez le même problème All right, so, I mean, they all adore the, the movie, obviously, they won't tell you that. And he's saying, I mean, laughing, but not so much that after he saw Robocop, when he walks in the streets, he has a feeling he actually walks like Robocop. <laughs> Do you... Does it feel the same way to you? Uh, when I when I saw the film when I was uh, 10, 11, my mother's a therapist and she wanted me to go see one of her colleagues because I wouldn't stop walking like <laughs> <laughs> Robocop. So I've had that experience. I I was 11 though, so what's your excuse? <laughs> I have no excuse. No excuse. No excuse. <laughs> Il y a d'autres questions uh, What oui. is your, your best memory from the shooting of this movie uh, Gee, ah. the last day, I'm kidding. Ah. <laughs> uh, you know, shooting this movie was the easiest part. Yes. It was easier to shoot than to develop a script and then to uh, post-produce. Uh, for several reasons. I mean, first off, we had 10, 10 to 2 weeks of rehearsal. With, with the actors and a big stage, empty stage, a writer, a table. We went through all the script. We did the scenes together with, with Joe, with Gary, with Michael Keaton, with Abby. The whole cast. The whole cast. And we cha shaped the, the, the script together and we changed the script there. Um, and it was fundamental. And it's fundamental for my process in particular because I always rehearse my movies in Brazil. Because for me, filmmaking is about finding a way to tell a story visually, and everything works for the story. So the camera doesn't work to make me look like a good director. It works. What's I don't know, What's the most cool shot means nothing to me. To me, is what's the best shot to tell the story. That's it. And and if it's a camera moving, if I think it is, then I'll move the camera. If it's the camera steady, then it will be steady. And so that concept that we are all working towards the story, uh, I had it with the cast. And then the film crew, you know, the studio allowed me to bring my DP from Brazil, uh, director of photography. We had an editor on the set who was also the editor of my other movies in Brazil. Uh, Eric Newman, who is here, is a friend and is a producer in the movie. I mean, I... I, I, I uh, yeah, no, he's a friend we've done. We've worked together before. We have other projects together. So it was an environment where everybody was working to shoot the movie, from, from the gaffer to the boy of the set. Everyone was working together to tell the story. And, and so it was very pleasantly shooting. And when you shoot like this, I mean, it's, it's not so difficult to actually shoot. I think the difficulty for the shooting, I mean, Joe had more difficulty than I had because he had to wear a suit. And it made him hot as hell. We had to blow him with cold water so he would, you know what I mean? But for me, shooting was was um, was easy. It wasn't that hard. Thank you. Other questions? Oh, yeah. Ah, ben voilà. Thank you very much.